feeling or work-life balance, none of that mattered. You just went to work and you worked and you worked and you worked. And that's not what we do now. So you're gonna get some tools today. And guys, don't worry. Yes, this is a woman code event, but you're an integral part of our lives as women every day. You're our husbands, our fathers, our brothers, your, our colleagues at work, our sons, our nephews. So we need you to be tuned into this too. And I promise you, you're gonna get some good stuff out of this as well. So everybody get ready if you can take notes. I know some of you are still eating, please finish <coughs> eating. But if you can take notes, do so. Um, if you wanna share some nuggets on social media, tag me at, at I am Sophia Nelson on Twitter and at Walgreens Jobs, which is streaming this on Twitter. And let's get a discussion started. Do you guys have a hashtag, Vivian? Anybody know social media, any hashtag? I can make one up. Uh, let's see, Walgreens Code. Why don't we call it Walgreens Code or something like that, right? Walgreens Code. So if you wanna put a hashtag to what you're hearing today, or you can just do the woman code. That's fine too, because that one is a popular tag on Twitter. All right, so first, what I wanna do is talk about what is your code? All right, does anybody, this is interactive. I might walk up to you, I might call on you, never know, so be ready. What is your code? Does anybody just throw out words at me? What's a code? What's a code? Rules. DNA. DNA, interesting. A symbol. Identification. A symbol. A symbol. Identification. Okay, a code. What is a code? Rules. Rules keeps coming up, it's interesting. Okay, so a code, it's something to be unlocked. I like that. Somebody said DNA, and I think that one's really good. So a code in this context. When I wrote a book called The Woman Code, I want you to know I wasn't trying to come up with a set of rules that I think women ought to follow because that would be my code. That would be what I live by. What I tried to do is to come up with what makes us similar in our DNA as women. So the DNA person over there, you've got it right. What is it that we share as women? Every woman in this room, room knows what I'm about to say is true. If you go into a restroom at a party and you're dressed up, you go into the restroom, do we not have conversations with people we've never met as women? We're looking at, we've never said a word to them, by the way. We're nodding our head, we're putting on makeup, and we've had a whole conversation. There's something about the language of women that's very unique and very different. And so when I talk about a code, next slide, please. Next slide. All right, so we're gonna talk about what is a code, your code, your life and leadership EIQ, and then we're gonna get into seven of the qualities everybody needs. Next slide. All right, every woman lives by a code, whether she knows it or not. Now what that means is your code is your standards. It's who you are. It's how you live. It's how you show up in the world. It's how you interact with other people. You could call it your character. You could call it your conscience. But your code is really important, ladies and gentlemen, because your code determines where you end up in life. I promise you that's a true statement. Who you are in here matters in the workplace, and it matters in everything that you do. So hold on to this working definition that one, a code is really, it's your DNA, it's who you are, it's how you live, it's how you see the world, not how other people around you do. And I'm making a suggestion to you that as women, we often operate by a similar code. Believe it or not, as different as we may appear, there's something about being a woman that's unique, it's powerful, and it's different. And I think that as we talked about at breakfast this morning, Carlos was saying that the studies show and the data shows that women who get the opportunity to lead in companies and lead at the top, those companies thrive. They make more money. They do better. They have better workplace programs. Isn't that an interesting thing? So there's something about being a woman that's very different and very unique. So just kind of hold on to that as the premise. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So we're gonna get right into it because of time. And I wanna go through seven of the codes in the book. There are 20 codes in the woman code. And again, when you read it, some of you've already read it, you got an advanced copy. And some of you've read it because you knew about the book which came out in 2014. But I chose seven codes, and then I'm gonna give you a bonus code. Seven codes that I wanna quickly talk about that I think are critical to your work-life balance to not just thriving here in corporate, ladies and gentlemen, but thriving in your life. 
So again, share them, tweet them, write them down, put them on your desk however you want to afterwards. I know for a fact that these will help you to get where you want to go in life. So code number one is the most basic of codes. Know your value. Know your value. That may seem very simple, but it's not. Because as girls, and I'm speaking specifically to us as women now, as girls, we're taught certain things. Every woman in this room, when you were a girl, you were taught certain codes that women should operate by and girls should operate by. We were talking about this at breakfast. Anybody in here ever been called bossy when you're little? She's bossy. <laughs> Or she talks too much. She's my chatty Kathy. She's bossy. There were certain norms and things, socialization as girls, that we were taught not to speak too much, to stay in our lane. We're also taught that other girls and women are our competition. Therefore, we don't collaborate as naturally as the boys do. The boys play football, they play sports, it's team, it's go team. They're taught to compete, but in a team environment where girls are taught if she's prettier, if she's smarter, if she's taller, if whatever, she's better and I have to compete. So knowing your value is shaped, ladies, by a lot of things. I call them the tapes that we play in our head. We've all got the tapes. Everybody in here plays the tapes. The tapes of your childhood determine a lot about who you become as a woman. So if you were told in my household, I'm the firstborn, and I was told all things wonderful about myself. That's my smart one, that one's gonna be a lawyer. Da, da, da. Now if you talk to my sibling, the baby, he got some different tapes. But my point is, is that many of you in this room had negative tapes. You had negative things said about you by the people who were supposed to encourage you and push you. And they didn't tell you that you were smart enough. They didn't tell you that you were pretty enough or that you could do anything. And to this very day, those tapes still play. So knowing your value is something, ladies, that if you can't get this code right, nothing else I say to you matters because if you don't know your value, no one else ever will. It's real simple. Knowing your values is simple as when you go up for your evaluation and you know, you're being evaluated and they ask you, do you have questions? Do you have something to say? Most of us won't have any questions. Most of us won't say anything. When it's time to ask for a raise, we don't wanna do it. We're socialized not to advocate for ourselves as women. We're socialized not to know our value and worth. And what I want you to understand is that the number one tool you need to be successful in your life and in your career is to know your value and your worth. It's fundamental, foundational, number one. So many of you are nodding your heads at me right now like, yes. Because I don't care what your title is, I don't care how high up you are. If you don't know your value and your worth, you're gonna make a lot of other people miserable around you. How many of us women know that woman? I like to call it the Queen Bee Syndrome. And you know, the, the woman who, she's got it all going on, but she doesn't really help other women. She does not necessarily nice or a champion of other women. That comes from a place of lack of value. It says that I'm the only one that can do this because if I elevate you, then my values diminish. I need you to throw that away. That's garbage. That's not true. And we'll talk a little more about, we're going to dig into that in one of the other codes, Lift Other Women As You Climb. But for now, I'm going to stick on this one for a moment because knowing your value is critical. Having the worth to speak up, having the worth to know that you are worth that raise. I have a friend in HR at a Fortune 10 company. And she tells me inevitably when they hire people, and women come in and they've made a job offer. Let's say the job offer was for $60,000 a year to start. She tells me, Sophia, we have another fifteen dollars to $20,000 that I can negotiate. <laughs> they never ask. She's like, the men come in and say, yeah, I know the offer was for 60, but I need to make 70. And they get it. She tells me, it's, she says, now as the HR person, I can't say, please ask me for more money. But her point is, is that women, they can have Ivy League credentials, the best of everything, and they will accept the offer. We don't negotiate our worth. So ladies, I need you to change your mind about this. This is the 21st century, we're in the year 2017. 
A woman has been nominated to be president of the United States. She didn't get there, but someday another woman will because she went first. And so I need you to understand that you have to begin to know your value and know your worth. Get out of the box, throw away the tapes. The tapes have no value unless they were positive. Anybody that told you what you couldn't be, who you couldn't be, and what you couldn't do, you need to throw that person out of your mind. You need to erase that because it doesn't matter now. All right, number two. This is one of my favorites. Live authentically. Anybody want to tell me what it means to be authentic? Come on, just throw words at me. Real self, true, true self, genuine. Keep going. Honest. That's interesting. Expand on that. That's good. Anybody else? Okay. Living authentically, you hit on some key words, but let me say this, particularly for women, for people of color, and for gays, lesbians, and transgender people. We have to wear a mask. Anybody disagree with that? Most of the time when we show up in the workplace, we're afraid to be our authentic selves. Whatever that means, whether it's speaking up, because we girls know, particularly if you're my age, if you're over 40 and you've been around for a while in corporate America, I've seen men do things in a room that I could never do. I remember being a young associate in one of the world's largest law firms in Washington, D.C., and one of the white male partners got up, and I'm not picking on white males. I like white males. I'm not picking on them. My great-grandfather's a white male, so I'm not picking on them. He got up, he was unhappy about something. He threw the folders across the table, said a few colorful words, and you know what the response was? Oh, that's just Jerry. If I had done that, <laughs> y'all know I would've been escorted out the door. Right. <laughs> we wear masks because, again, socialization and culture says we have to. But that's the beauty of a program like this, and I really would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Steve Pemberton, and I'm gonna embarrass him now, but I have to do this because Steve is a great asset to Walgreens. He's a good friend to me. He's a big brother. He's a sponsor and a mentor, and he gets that this diversity and inclusion thing is real. We were talking about this last night over dinner with his lovely wife, and we are talking about the pipeline in corporate, and what's it gonna look like 10 years from now? Or 20 years from now, will there be more women head to the Fortune 500? Will there be more people of color? Because right now it's abysmal. It's terrible. It's less than 10 out of 500 companies. Less than 10 are headed by women or a person of color. So this living authentically is very hard when we're constantly having to shrink back and duck and be afraid of being who we really are because we know it's not going to be accepted or we're not going to get the same pass. So I want you to think about living authentically in a bit of a different context. I want you to think about it in the sense of inclusion. And what I mean by that is, I want you to take the mask off of who you are. Because you can't soar to your greatest heights if you're pretending to be somebody else. And you can't soar to your greatest heights and go as high as your gifts will take you if you're constantly living up to someone else's definition of who you are. As a black woman in America, I'm supposed to be angry all the time, <laughs> too strong, too independent, too much of this and not enough of that. Yep. It doesn't matter. We talk, when I walk into a room, some people have sized me up already in three seconds. Oh, okay. And it makes you shrink back because if your gift is to speak or your gift is to write or your gift is to build or whatever your gift is, you're constantly worried about how somebody's going to see you and define you. I will tell you, get out of the box. I tell the story, I was about 35, 36 years old. I was up for partner that year. And I was telling Brex this morning how I started having chest pains. I got a beautiful office overlooking Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm about to make partner, which means I'm gonna go from making $350,000 a year to well over a half a million and the sky's the limit, right? I'm gonna be one of the few black women partners in a major law firm. And it's all looking good, only I'm not happy. I don't wanna be a lawyer and I don't wanna be in a law firm. But I was marching to the beat of a drum that was set forth for me by my family. 
There's a lot of expectations, and some of you know this when you're first generationist or that, or you're the first one to go to college. Parents give you an option, doctor or lawyer, choose one. So you choose one. I knew I wasn't going to be a doctor because I didn't like the whole blood thing. But I knew I liked the talk, as you can tell, so lawyering was going to be my thing. And it's not bad. Being a lawyer has opened a lot of doors, but I wasn't living in my purpose. I wasn't living authentically. I knew I wanted to be a writer for the Washington Post. I knew that I wanted to write books, and I'd been talking about it my whole life. I remember sitting down with my parents when we were talking about colleges and high school. I said, I want to be a journalist. My dad said, that's not a real profession. I mean, he, he didn't mean any harm. He just... That's not a real, that's not a real career. And so I had to make a decision that day when my chest was hurting and they took me across the street to GW Hospital. Doctor looked at me and said, your tests are great. You're in perfect health. What's your real problem? I start crying and I don't cry. And she's like, what's wrong? Everything was wrong because I wasn't living in my gifts. So I had to make a decision. Do I give up this lucrative career path where I can be set, or do I go out and become a journalist? Journalists don't get paid a whole lot. And, and write books, and maybe nobody's gonna ever publish anything I have to say. Well, fast forward a decade later, three bestsellers, one award winning, one Pulitzer nomination. I could go on and on and on, not bragging, but I'm making a point, I took a leap. I decided to be me and walk on the path that was supposed to be mine and it's worked out pretty well for me. I'm standing here at Walgreens talking to all of you. So please be you, do you, live your life, be authentic. Next quote. This one, particularly to you young people in the room, life hasn't happened yet. Keep living. <laughs> Life's going to throw things at you. Some things are going to be very unfair. You're going to lose people that you love. You're going to have illnesses. You're going to have financial challenges. Marriage will start out wonderful. It might end in divorce. Whatever it is, none of us ever wakes up thinking about the things that will go wrong. But I promise you, something will go wrong. The question is not when it will happen or why, but what you're going to do when it happens. And being resilient is something that I think women actually excel at. It is probably one of the best traits that we as women have because we're a lot stronger than we know and a lot stronger than others think. And that ability to bounce back in your career, that ability to bounce back in your life is what makes the difference between you and somebody else. It separates the winners. And I hate to say, I don't like the word losers, but there are winners and losers in life. And the people that get up here and the people that plateau here, the difference is the people that got here kept going when the door shut, when the window shut, when they were blocked, when they were blackballed, because all that stuff happens in our careers and in our lives. So be resilient. Keep getting back up. No matter what life throws at you, you got to get back up again. Next, never cut what you can untie. This comes from my grandmother, sixth grade education, country girl from South Carolina. She said, baby, never cut what you can untie. I had no idea what she meant. And then I grew up. And what she was simply saying is, don't burn bridges. Now, look, of all the things I may tell you today, this one's important. Particularly for the people in this room, because many of us are different. We're women. We're of color. Gays and lesbians. The whole thing. We're, we're different. We're the outliers, right? We're different. So... We have to be extra careful of how we handle our relationships, how we navigate crisis, how we navigate difficulties. Some of you are gonna have difficult bosses. Some of you have difficult bosses right now. Some of you are dealing with some stuff and you don't have a clue what to do about it. The way that you handle it's gonna, again, determine where you end up. So by never cutting what you can untie, what my grandmother was saying is this, there's a point in life where you just need to step back from something and you need to sometime step back. Don't go off on your boss. Don't send a crazy email that replies all to 150 people that you work with. <laughs> That's not going to be helpful. That's a career limiting move as I like to say, okay? There also does come a time in life
life. And I obviously made that decision when I was at Holland and Knight, which was that I needed to cut and I needed to jump and I needed to risk and go do what I wanted to do. Now, I still have wonderful relations. They represent me in all the work that I do. So it's great. But there's a time when there should be a breaking in your life, whether it's interpersonal relationships. There's a time when the boss has become so toxic and the situation is so toxic. And what most people do in this room is you lament. You go home and you complain about it. I hate my life. I hate my job. But you don't do anything about it. You do know, right, I'm a prayer. Praying about stuff is only going to get you so far. you got to do something, ladies. You have to take an action. So if you're not happy and if something's not working, you have to make a break. There are some things you must break from in order to get to where you're going. There are other things that you just need to step back from and give it a minute and breathe and rest. And it will work itself out. Never cutting what you can untie has served me very well. There are some people I wanted to really let happen, but I held my peace, I shut my mouth, and I just stepped back, and it works itself out. There are some things, if they're not good for your soul, good for your spirit, good for the, and I'm talking, I know the statistics. There's a lot of stuff going on in this room that people are dealing with that you don't talk about, that you don't tell anybody about. You sucking it up, you keeping it to yourself. There's some stuff you need to get rid of. There's some stuff you need to cut and it's weighing you down. It's like a weight. It's an anchor on your soul. It's an anchor on your wings. You're not flying in your career because you're, you're tethered to something that's bad for you. I don't know what it is, but you need to cut it. You need to cut it. Next code, lift other women as you climb. Okay, boy, we can do a whole day on this one. Lift other women as you climb. This is a quote from the great Dr. Janetta Besh Cole, who uh, was the president of Spelman. Uh, years ago and at a commencement speech one year she said we need to lift other women as we climb I remember watching I think C-SPAN had just come out yes I'm dating myself <laughs> and I love that phrase lift other women as we climb because ladies we're bad at this one the boys do this better than we do and again it goes back to that socialization we all know what we do to each other as women the cattiness the gossip that's one of the codes I won't get in today but that is code number nine the backbiting, it's, it's again, it's that competition. And let me say this, it's never unhealthy to compete. Competition's okay when you do it with respect and you do it without having to demean somebody else and break somebody else down. But let me tell you what I know for sure. When you lift as you climb, when you lift as you climb, you go further because people like you. People want to be on your team. Nobody wants to work for somebody that's all about them. Nobody wants to work for a woman, like I said, it has got Queen Bee Syndrome, where she's the only one, she's not helping other chicks because the boys harassed her when she came up 30 years ago, so she's gonna harass you. This isn't a sorority, I pledged one of those, that's over. You, the, the workplace is not a sorority where we haze other women to get into our club. The workplace should be a place where we as women build into each other, share. One of the chief nuggets I want you to take away is sharing. Share what you know with other women. Share what you've learned. Share what didn't go right. Say, hey, you're new at the job. Let me take you to coffee. And don't take her to bash 20 people at the company. Right. Stay away from so-and-so. Don't do that. Take her to coffee and say, let me show you how to navigate this. And come to me if you need me. And also, don't underestimate the secretary pool the administrative assistants, because they wield all the power in corporate America. If you didn't know that, yeah. you need to make them your friends yeah. because they are a wheelhouse of knowledge. They know where all the bodies are buried. They know everything. <laughs> so so don't, 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 don't consider another woman too low for you to talk to right. that's, that's beneath right. you. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. you got to lift other women as you climb. Because let me tell you what I know for sure, and then we'll move to the next code. When you don't lift other women as you climb here's what happens in life what goes up comes down so you may get to the top of the ladder but guess what one day you're gonna have to retire one day somebody's not gonna like you and ask you and then what when you're going on your way down you're gonna see the same people that you weren't real nice to but ladies let me tell you what I know about being in a sorority and if you play this game right it works 
which is when you build into those younger women coming under you and you help them and you lift them, guess what? If somebody gives you a pink slip one day, you know what those younger women that you mentored are going to do for you? They're going to make sure you get a contract on your way out the door. They're going to make sure you're treated well on your way out the door. They're going to make sure you don't ever get put out the door because you will have built loyalty. You will have sown good seeds. So again, some of the women that I know have known in my career who were hellions and they just retell on other women. They did because they had it done to them. And so it was a vicious cycle. Those women didn't end up well because when they lost their jobs, there was no one there for them. The boys weren't going to do it. Not back then. So lift other women as you climb. Lift, and man, this goes for you too. Lift others as you climb. Sponsor, mentor, but you guys are better at this. Like I said, I will give it to you and say it. You're better at this than we are. And women, we need to learn it because it's a critical tool to success in your life and your career. Know your front row. Another grandmomism. You better know your front row. Okay. What does that mean? You see this front row? Rows are front rows the VIPs, right? You usually go to movie theater, you go to the play. The best tickets in the house are in the front row, right? The people in the front row of your life are the most important people. They're what I call my love council. They're my council. They're the people I go to who have permission to tell me like it is. You do not want a bunch of yes men in your life. Do you know why? Because yes people will lead you to the water and they'll let you drown. So you better get some folks in your life who tell you the truth. And that front row, particularly in your career, your mentors and your sponsors are different. A mentor is someone that you can kind of go to and bounce things off and say, hey, do you think I ought to take this job or should I do that or this? A mentor is kind of like a big brother or a big sister. They mentor you. They, they can bounce things. They can help you navigate. But a sponsor is very different. A sponsor is someone who will put their cachet on the line and they will open doors for you. They will knock things down for you. They will help you to get places you couldn't get without someone like them. Steve Pemberton did that for me by bringing me here. And I would like to say we had a good meeting with the Pride group before and it was outstanding. I'm a conservative Christian and I've had some views that haven't been maybe consistent with what the pride group would have liked the scene. And instead of us not talking to each other, you know what Steve did? Steve said, we're going to sit down and have a conversation. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But I feel good about sharing that with you. Let, you know, you work in a company where people actually practice what they preach. And they are about this inclusion piece being real. So knowing your role in life, knowing who's in your life matters. There's a leadership principle. The five people that you spend the most time with in your life you're connected to determine your life. I said they determine your life. What do I mean by that, Sophia? Well, what I mean is if you're hanging out with people who have negative talk, who don't want anything, who are plateaued, that's where you're going to end up. But if you have people in your life, I try to surround myself with people that are where I want to go. They're bigger than me. They, they're, they're smarter than me. If you're hanging around with people and you're the smartest person in the room, you're not doing well. You're just not. You've got to put yourself in the company of people that will push you to greatness. So know your role. Important in corporate life because everything we do in corporate is relationships. It's not what you know. It's always who you know. You know that that's a true principle. How many of you have seen people go up the ladder and you're like, huh? <laughs> they had people that liked them. They were good. They had the gift of gab. They knew how to invite people to their home. Connect. Know your role and get people in your life who will tell you the truth. Important. All right, one more to go and then we're done and then we'll finish it out on the backside. Courageous conversations. I alluded to this a few moments ago. This one is critical again in crisis management. Crisis navigation requires you to talk to somebody. Now, young people in the room, I know this one's hard for you because you like to text and everything is a text, but I got to tell you something, texting ain't talking. It's not. A conversation is two human beings audibly speaking to each other. It can be on the phone. I'm a Gen Xer, so I like the phone. 
Remember the teen line got put in my house, and I thought life couldn't get any better than that. <laughs> Call waiting. Oh, my God. <laughs> talking is what we're doing. Texting is not talking. More disasters have been caused in business. Are, are you paying attention to the same news I'm watching every day? <laughs> Texting, videos, emails, it'll get you in trouble. You gotta learn to talk to people, particularly when you're angry, particularly when something is wrong. When you have to go to your team, don't send out that reply to all email again. I've seen careers ruined over reply to all emails. Somebody was going off, somebody was venting. Instead of getting out of their chair, going down the hallway, can I talk to you for a minute? Can we go grab a coffee or something? We forgot how to be human beings. You gotta put these devices down, these devices. Microsoft did a study that said the human attention span 25 years ago was about a minute and so, some change. It's now less than 10 seconds. And that's because of the devices. We operate in 140 characters. That's it, 140 characters. And if I can't say it to you in that, I'm done. People asking people for divorces on text now. This isn't made up. I know one sorority sister got served divorce papers on a text. That's a true story. I, huh? <laughs> Courageous conversation means what we did this afternoon. We may not agree on everything. We may not see the world exactly the same, but we can sit down and we can talk, and we can agree that we're human beings. And we can agree that if we can start there about our humanity and our shared humanity, that we can do some things together that we can help feed people together, we can help clothe people together, we can help love God together. Whatever the thing is, there's stuff you can do when you're willing to talk about it. I know some of you are looking at me horrified, like, you want me to talk to somebody? You've got to talk. Courageous conversation. Last bonus code, I thought I'd have some fun with this one. So you all know Steve Harvey's book, Faith Like a Man. I hate that book. <laughs> so one of the codes in the woman code in the professional section is don't think like a man. Ladies, why would you want to think like a man? You are a woman. And that in and of itself is glorious and powerful and amazing and awesome. And as Carlos said to me this morning, when women run things, they run better. It's, this is a man saying this, more efficient, more effective. But let me say this. Some of my best mentors and sponsors have been men. Particularly when I was coming up, there weren't very many women in the workplace, particularly not in big law firms in my profession. And they were white men. Because there weren't very many men of color. And I want you to know that there are things we can learn from the guys. And men, you're here today and thank you. We need you to be a part of this conversation because perceptions won't change and stereotypes won't change unless men speak up and unless men take women under their wing. And again, I go back to my friend Steve. Steve didn't have to bring me here, but he did. And again, navigating an issue, he sat down and he said, we're going to have a conversation about how Sophia sees the world versus how the pride group sees the world, and we're gonna talk. And I really am excited about the conversation we had because it opened my eyes to some things. As somebody who lives life differently and sees the world differently, I realized I don't have any gay friends. I don't. I, and, and, and it's like Steve said, I might have some and not know it, but at the end of the day, I realized I need to get out of my little safety box a little bit. I'm a woman of color and 90% of the people I hang out with are people who look like me in my same education level, my same socioeconomic status. I live in Loudoun County, Virginia, the richest county in America. It is a, it's just a little suburbia, you know what it's like. And so when you get into those spaces, you don't see other people. And so this notion of thinking like a man is bad advice. There are women and we know them who again, came up when life was hard, came up when they didn't have the mentors and the sponsors, and they had it tough. We're seeing all this stuff break out with sexual harassment, right? And there was a quote this morning on Twitter from the actress Maureen O'Hare, who played in Gone with the Wind. And this was in the 40s. She was complaining about being harassed. It's on Twitter, it's everywhere, you should see it. Somebody dug this article up where she complained. Well, back in her day, no one was hearing her. 
She was blackballed from further roles because she wouldn't play ball. So this notion that we have to do what the boys do to be successful, we have to be as hard or be as tough. We all know women like this and very few of us like them because they try to be like the boys. And I'm telling you, your power does not rest in you being like a man. Your power rests in you being a woman and all the wonderfulness that that brings. But our brothers, our husbands, our fathers, our sons, they can teach us something. And like I said, Carlos, at breakfast this morning, I think that men do a lot better at the helping each other. It's the boys club, whatever you want to call it, because they're taught from the time they're little to compete, yes, but he's top dog, I'll follow him. We don't do that as women. Why do I have to listen to her? Who does she think she is? She thinks she's cute. We, we do this stuff because no, I'm telling the truth. And it's just not helpful. So next slide, please. How much time do I have? Uh, about 10 more minutes. About 10 moments in order to do some questions? Okay. What is your leadership IQ? Who wants to tell me what emotional IQ is? Throw out stuff at me. Yeah, to be able to read your surroundings. Read a room, read a surroundings. Anybody else? Gauge one another. Gauge one another. Anybody else? How you connect. How you connect. I like that. Anybody else? Understanding your own emotions. Very good. Next slide. This is something that um, I took from the Woman Code because I thought it was important about what leadership is. And if you look at the definitions that I give of leadership, those are what I would call soft leadership skills, right? Maybe they're more feminine leadership skills, if you will, right? But again, your emotional intelligence, next slide, is your ability to navigate your own self, know your strengths and weaknesses, because a good leader, ladies and gentlemen, knows what he or she cannot do. And then you delegate. Again, control freaks like me don't like to delegate. And that usually gets me into trouble. So you have to be able to know your limitations. You've got to know what you're good at and what you're not. And you also have to be able to read the emotions. And notice, I said emotions. At the end of the day, we work with human beings, right? We have issues. Sometimes somebody's going to have a bad day. Maybe your child is sick. You got elderly parents, you know, all this stuff, next slide, has to come into, has to come into how you operate as a human being first and at work. I like to call it the three F's, fair, focused, and flexible. I promise you, if you follow this simple formula, fair, focused, and flexible, how you deal with people, you're not going to have any problems. Fair, focused, and flexible. You don't need me to break that down for you. It's obvious. Simple things that will help you to soar. It will help you to gain the respect of your team, help you to be a team player. It's all about knowing the soft skills. I think too much we emphasize technical skills, education, and all those things matter. But we forget about the human being part, and that's what the woman code is about. It's about navigating from the inside out and not from the outside in. It's about leading from here. Next slide. Living Life 316. That just means living your life, it's balanced. It's not, I work all the time and I don't have a social life. I work all the time and I don't work out. I work all the time and I don't have any time for meditation or peace. How many of you work too much in this room? <laughs> Tell the truth. Okay, good, that's a pretty good balance. You guys are doing well then, that's awesome. Next, next slide. Empathy. I'm going to go through these quickly because you know these, but they're important. Again, the woman code is an answer. Empathy, a very important skill. Your ability to understand what somebody else is going through. If you do that, it will serve you well. Next slide. Character. We talked about this. My grandmother used to say, guard your character and not your reputation. Your reputation is who people say you are. Your character is who you are. Your character shows up at your work and in your personal life more than anywhere else. Who you are matters. Guard your character. Next. Vision. This goes back to code number one, knowing your value. 
I want you to leave here today and I want you to do a couple things for me and for yourself, more importantly, more for you than for me. Number one, I want you to do a sheet, what I call a know your row sheet. And I want you to make a list of who needs to stay and who needs to go. I'm not joking. Now the truth is you already know. You keep, you keep that friend around that drives you crazy. You already know who needs to go. That's the first thing. Do a road check. As we're ending 2017 and going into 2018, do a road check. It's a simple exercise. You'll be amazed at who shows up on what list in your life. And then you have to act accordingly. Don't call up somebody and say, I'm not going to be your friend no more. Don't do that. <laughs> and what I do want you to do in setting a vision for your life, you've got to do, do something. The next thing that I want you to do is I want you to write down a know your value sheet. And I want you to write down the things I like about myself and the things I don't like about myself. If you journal, this is a perfect exercise. Again, we're at the end of the year. There are about 55 days left in this year, and then we're on to a new year. If you're waiting till December 31st to make your New Year's list, you waited too long. You need to start thinking about that now. And the last thing that I want you to do is, and this one's going to be hard, but I want you to do this because if you do it, it will radically change your life. I want you to write down who you need to have a courageous conversation with. Who from your past, only if it's safe, if it's someone that you can access, it's, it's okay. Maybe it's a parent, a sibling, somebody that you used to know. And again, if it's safe and if it makes sense, but who do you need to get off something off your chest? Who do you need to talk to? And I'm not talking about yelling at somebody or disrespecting somebody. I'm talking about having a conversation where you try to get some answers, some closure, some healing. Those three things that I told you to do make up the vision of your life. They will help you because they're weights that you're carrying right now. If you've got the wrong people around you, if you don't know your value, and if you're carrying this junk, you're still mad at the boss from the last job, and you're taking it out on the new boss who's actually nice, but you, you've been mistreated by the last boss. It's like a relationship, right? It's a cycle. Break the cycle by living by a code. Every woman and every man lives by a code. And that code determines where you end up. That's my presentation. Thank you.